Has anybody taken the time to explain to you the different levels of hospice? Wait, wait, wait. There, there are levels to hospice? There's like stages and different areas and different perks? Perks to hospice? Yes, there are perks to hospice. And there's a huge benefit to you, your loved one, with being on hospice that a lot of families don't know about. So in this podcast, myself and Emlyn, our director of nursing, are going to walk through what does it look like for you to fully understand the different levels of hospice. So we're going to walk through those levels together to help you get a good understanding of the true benefit of hospice and how you don't have to do this whole thing, this end of life process alone by yourself. There's hospice around to help support you and your loved one through this process. So let's enjoy this podcast. Let's go. How's it going? It's good. How doing are good. you? I'm doing good. Hello, I'm doing friends. Good. What's up, y'all? We're back at it. We really want to break down the different types of levels of hospice care. I think families a lot of time, a lot of times they say, "Hey, like, what are you? Am I gonna get a nurse at the bedside 24/7? Um, what, what are, what can I expect?" And I think what we want to do with this specific um, video is just talk about the different types of levels of care. Mm -hmm. So there are four levels of care. There is that are four correct? pillars, yes. Cool. So we've got routine. Mm -hmm. We've got continuous care. Mm -hmm. We've got respite care. And then we've got GIP. Mm -hmm. So say, for instance, my loved one is discharging from the hospital. And they're fairly stable, but the doctor says they're going to need hospice. Mm -hmm. And their um, cancer diagnosis, maybe. And... They're like, oh my gosh, wait, I'm, I have to go home. Like, what am I going to do? Walk us through the different stages of this specific patient mm -hmm. and when they'll need those four different levels of care. Cool. So let's heading home. Hospice just came to me at the hospital and the nurse said, hey, we're going to admit, we're going to transport your loved one from the hospital home. What does this look like? So usually you're started on routine home care. Okay. Um, uh, there are a few cases where we will admit straight on to continuous care because we know the patient is imminent. Mm -hmm. um, and I can explain that and break that down a little bit. So routine home care is um, is the care that we provide on a day-to-day -day basis that's not emergent type care. So it may be regular visits from a skilled nurse, the aide, um, the social worker, the chaplain, the volunteer. All of those disciplines are visiting on a regular basis because they are, um, were, to some degree, your loved one is stable. Mm -hmm. So um, it's it's while there's not an emergency. So um, like our Alzheimer's patients, they're on routine home care because they could be in that spa same space for six plus months. Gotcha. Um, their meds are organized. The nurse is just kind of checking in. Yes, they may have little things here and there that might change. Like they might get pneumonia, they might get a UTI, they might get um, a cough or something. But for the most part, there's not an emergency where it requires someone there all the time. Gotcha. Um, so that's routine home care. Okay. And most of the time our patients start on that care. Routine. Um, continuous care is what a lot of people think of when they think of hospice. They mm -hmm. think of uh, a nurse sitting at the bedside 24-7 mm -hmm. or, or somebody from hospice being in your home 24-7. Mm -hmm. um, generally that care only lasts for three to four days, okay. sometimes a week, sometimes two weeks. Just depends on the decline, the severity, the symptoms, um, and the nurse is the one who evaluates that plan of that that change in level okay, okay. of care. So, um, I I tell people whenever they're interviewing hospices, this is a big question to ask mm -hmm. because there are a lot of hospices who will say we don't do continuous care mm. for whatever reason. Whatever reason, yeah. So. 
it is a very important thing, especially if your loved one is at home, um, because you don't want to feel like you're alone. Now, that's the caveat of there are Medicare requirements. The mm-hmm. nurse has to evaluate and have an actual reason to have a skilled nurse at the bedside. So, so what would be like some examples of reasons that the nurse looks at? So let's say, for instance, this patient that we were, the hypothetical is her name is Betty. Mm-hmm. So Betty's been on routine care mm-hmm. consistently. And then all of a sudden there's a couple changes that occur what are some signs and symptoms of some changes that would warrant continuous care? So let's say Betty needs medication every three to four hours Mm. for a while. The family could be coming fatigued um, and, and maintaining that medication administration every three to four hours or that changing of a diaper or that care of a bed bound patient can get fatiguing to anybody yeah. that's why shifts in the hospital are only 12 hours because yeah. after 12 hours you need a rest you need, you need a break um so that can get fatiguing and so that for that reason uh, caregiver strain is one big reason um or it could be that miss betty's symptoms have changed and she is requiring frequent medication administration that um, the family doesn't feel capable or is not currently managing those nonverbal cues of well, what that yes. patient needs um, well. And mm-hmm. so that's why we want somebody skilled at the bedside to gotcha. say, her breathing's really fast, she's probably in pain. Okay, we tried this an hour ago and she's still breathing really fast and restless, let's try some anxiety medicine. Okay, her breathing's still really fast, do we need to go up on that dose of medication? Okay, now she's restless, but her she started gurgling. Now what do I do? Mm. You know, um, those skilled attempts at, or if if the family has been calling us every hour because they're not yeah. sure what to do, you can't live like that for three days. No. <laughs> um, and some people just have a really slow decline. They might be um, unconscious and and more abundant for for several days. Mm. And we say at that point, that's God's timing. Like. It's in God's hands right, right. when when they're gonna let go, right. um, and they could be waiting for a family member or you know whatever else, and and um, you know that just gets fatiguing. You have to you have to care for them for a long time, and yeah. so sometimes that's the reason. Another reason is facilities don't have the staff to give certain medications at certain hours of the day or hours of the night, mm. and so a lot of times facilities will ask us if we can provide that continuous care because there's nobody on staff to yeah. give those medications to that patient will need at 2 a.m. or somebody skilled enough to assess for that need at 2 a.m. And so we have to do continuous care for those patients too sometimes. So continuous care can happen in any place, right? In any setting for the patient's home. Mm -hmm. So if they're in a home with family, continuous care can start get started. Mm -hmm. If they're in a facility or even a group home. Yes. So continuous care is anywhere where that resident yes. or that patient resides yeah so our our first ditch effort is definitely to try and equip the family yeah. equip the facility equip the group home equip the memory care whoever is yeah. taking care of that person on a day-to-day basis equip them to take care of that person uh, with with the tools in your toolbox yeah. with the comfort kit with whatever and not every patient needs all of those True. Uh-huh. Yeah. and not only that but i think there's a lot of family members who want to be involved mm-hmm. and so the hospice is there to empower them to mm-hmm. actually yes go ahead and do this mm-hmm. call us we can walk you through it mm-hmm. but a lot of times when they're not comfortable that's when we can also yes utilize continuous care so continuous care walk us through the the business side of continuous care so the, there's a round-the-clock nurse that's there, mm-hmm. and is the nurse their own staff or the another staff, or how many frequently is why does another staff come in to check on them? Kind of walk us through that, okay. and and what's the protocol to to redo or to reassess daily if the person needs continuous care another day? Mm-hmm. So there are requirements for continuous care. We the the onus of the hospice agency has to be the one under the care and direction of the medical director to assess and prove that this patient is appropriate for continuous care. Medicare does reimburse daily at a higher rate while that patient is on that level of care Mm -hmm. because a lot of times what happens is one, the medications cost more, Mm -hmm. um, and then two, we usually have to outsource our care. So we're providing that around the clock skilled nursing care of an LDN or an RN. Um, 
Our agency uses a third party staffing agency that we trust um, who has a group of, of nurses that can provide that care and generally they choose two nurses that will choose for the case. Mm -hmm. um, the staffing agency decides all of that based on location and all of mm -hmm. the things. Um, and then they um, they provide that staff to be at the bedside and then they, they switch every 12 hours. So mm -hmm. basically we, we tell our families, okay, you're going to have a nurse come at 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. every day um, and then they'll switch shifts basically. But okay. usually it's the same two people um, so that there's that continuity of care, especially while you're in a home. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, yes, Medicare requires uh, the nurse from the hospice to make daily visits um, because they need to assess that the plan of care is being appropriately followed, the family is happy, the patient is comfortable, yeah. um, and that it's appropriate for continuous care to stay on board because a lot of times, like, that patient might get comfortable, mm -hmm. but then they're they're needing medication every hour to two hours that's a lot for the family right. to to provide and that's not something that we could pull out right, and, right, right. Um, change so we we want a peaceful death um there are times that continuous care is needed for a caregiver crisis so we've had patients who their main caregiver is their only loved one that's able to take care of them and the patient is not safe to be yeah, by themselves, yeah. the caregiver has some sort of an emergency where they've had to go in the hospital and we've yeah. had to do continuous care for that patient because yeah. the patient is stable, yeah. Yeah. Um, but they don't have a caregiver. There's yeah. nobody there to take care of them and they don't have any family. Yeah, yeah. So, remember we had a patient recently mm -hmm. um, that, you know, kept taking care of their spouse, had to go have surgery, mm -hmm. and then the spouse was at home by themselves, so we had that and have continuous care until they came back from mm -hmm. surgery. So that's, that's really good. All right, if you're watching this, thank you so much. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe this video. It helps, I think, the algorithm a lot. And uh, I hope this helps and educates you well. So let's keep it moving. So now Betty is starting continuous care. Um, what, what's doc, what are they documenting? Like how, how is that nurse that's giving all those medications how are they kept accountable as well from the agency? So our, uh, the agency's nurse, the hospice's nurse, mm -hmm. is going to go out and assess and look at their documentation every tw every 24 hours, basically. Okay. The agency has to supervise that nurse that's at the bedside. So her job is each day, or his job, sorry, mm -hmm. to go out and assess how many meds have been given in the last 24 hours, how frequently are you giving it, do we need refills? Do we need to switch up how frequently we're giving something? Right. Um, is this anxiolytic not working well? Do we need to switch to a different anxiolytic? Is this pain medication not being effective? Do we need to switch to a different pain medication? Um, and you have the ability to titrate a lot easier when a skilled person is at the bedside because they're familiar with those medications, mm -hmm. they're familiar with the safety regimen. So it is our job to ensure that that patient is getting safely cared for, um, that nurse at the bedside is required to chart every hour. Mm -hmm. So they have paper charting that they chart. Um, usually our agency provides a binder to these the, the staff that is gonna be at the bedside. Mm -hmm. um, and they get like a care plan, their DNR, um, kind of some family history. And then our agency has to start that continuous care um, level of care basically mm -hmm. um, and so they have to give them a very thorough report of like hey here's what's going on here's why CC is appropriate and then um, it is our job to to manage that entire care that's awesome that's yeah. awesome that's good to know because I think a lot of times there are so many steps that have to um, be reviewed and addressed before continuous care can get yes. started it's not just that you could just send someone out mm -hmm. to be at the bedside it's a level of care yes. so like it's like literally it's a level like you've it's got the first floor level, yes. yep second floor you know third floor fourth floor mm -hmm. so i think it's so that's so good for families to know number one okay there's there's going to be someone at the bedside but also to hold them accountable as okay yeah they should be documenting mm -hmm. right what are you giving my loved one yeah. yeah, it's okay to ask questions. And you should ask yeah. questions. You absolutely should ask questions because not in a threatening way to that right. nurse at the bedside, but to say, okay, you're giving this. Why are you giving that? Right. Can you explain what is telling you my right. my mom needs that right, right. now? Right. Like, and she can't talk to me, so how do you know? 
Yeah, and another thing I think it's it's good for families to, when you have a relationship with your nurse case manager that's taking care of your loved one, to call call them and reach yeah. out to them and say, hey, I just want to make sure I'm understanding what the continuous care nurse is doing. Can you mm -hmm. include me? That's mm -hmm. really what is so helpful for families when they do that, yeah. uh, because you're it's a it's a team. It's there to help your loved one. So okay, so we got Betty now is on continuous care. Um, let's just say continuous care isn't warranted for Betty, uh, but the family's just tired. Oh, yeah. Like, they're exhausted, you know, they're, Betty's is, you know, sleep, waking up in the middle of the night a lot, but not really, you know, in pain, not really in those things. What is one way that, that someone can get relief or caregiver can get relief? This is the another pillar of hospice. Um, we can provide something called respite care. So respite is exactly what respite means. It's a break. Mm -hmm. um, and so the goal of respite is to provide caregiver relief. Um, per Medicare guidelines in Texas, we are allowed to uh, offer respite to our patients as often as five days within a 30 day period. So basically every month. Um, so. We do have patients who regularly utilize the respite benefit and every single month they go uh, because their family needs a break or they've got grandkids in another state and they need to go and see them um, or whatever else have you. But um, yeah, caregiver fatigue is very real. Mm -hmm. And so the goal is to, to provide them relief. Um, the way that that works is that the hospice contracts with skilled nursing facilities in various areas in a various, in the metroplex, in, yeah. yeah, areas in the metroplex. Thank you. Um, and they, uh, we contract with them. And every time your loved one goes to that respite facility, we give them a one-time contract for that five-day stay. Mm -hmm. um, and there's ways to work around that, um, and we can be flexible. You just have to talk to your hospice mm -hmm. about yeah. about like, say, you need seven days or you need ten days yeah. or what that looks like. Yeah, so. and I think the biggest thing is that. You know, respite is a level of care that every hospice is, is supposed to provide, but not every hospice provides it because they just may not have that relationships mm -hmm. or that's another thing to ask the hospice is do you provide respite yeah. care and how frequently? Some hospices do it quarterly, that's you know, true. because because the reason why is because you have to manage the resources that Medicare yes. is giving you. So, you know, there's there's a bucket that they give you, but you have to manage that per how many patients you have. And mm -hmm. so because what happens is you know, the, the hospice will then have to pay that um, facility, mm -hmm. the nursing facility, for the days that they're yeah, there. Yeah, for a set rate. For a set rate. And so I think it's such a great benefit for families mm -hmm. because they get some rest. So, and then the hospice does supervision visits too. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. usually our RN, our aid continues going just as frequently as they have been going. Um, the RN makes at least one visit, if not two, depending on the frequency. Um, and then usually our social worker tries to go and check in and the chaplain as well mm -hmm. too, um, just to make sure that the, that, that patient feels supported and loved mm -hmm. because they are away from their family. They're yeah. away from their normal environment. We get that. Um, and so, so that's, uh, it's just our, our familiar faces yeah. in an unfamiliar environment. Yeah. Another great thing for families is that sometimes, you know, when you're, when you're picking a hospice, you can ask them what, what facilities do you contract with? Yep. And then you can actually go visit those facilities too. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good, so it puts you at ease as knowing where your loved yep. one is actually going. Yep. Uh, I think it's a, it's a good thing that we've seen over the years mm -hmm. that families really do a good job of, they're like, Nima, if I take a look and go visit we've that facility. We've even had some families like recommend facilities mm -hmm. to us because they've had like a, a rehab stay, or, stay there or whatever yeah. else. So yeah, um, don't, don't feel afraid to ask the hospice that yeah. you're interviewing yeah. what, um, what kind of respite facilities they work with, do they offer it, and mm -hmm. can we suggest one? Because mm -hmm. um, awesome. most of the time it is just a contract yep. um, that can be drawn up. It's very easy. Yep. So. Awesome. So now we got respite care. Well, now what if Betty is having some uncontrolled symptoms that can't even be managed at home? Like Betty's throwing up everywhere or mm -hmm. bleeding everywhere or just, just crazy things. What happens then? I, I know with hospice, you know, that's not really, you're not supposed to go to the hospital or what is that? Walk us through that. What is the next level? So the last level of care that is um, a challenging one is called GIP, uh, general inpatient. So essentially what that looks like is a hospice has a contract with either a skilled nursing facility that has 24-7 RN on staff 
or they have a, a contract with a hospital or a hospital floor. Mm -hmm. um, and basically they can provide hospice care on that unit um, within a certain, there are constraints obviously. Right. Um, so it's essentially a hospital bed. Uh, it's an inpatient unit. Mm -hmm. um, so generally those patients are the patients that are requiring um, I would say most of the time intravenous care of something. So let's say Betty has a port um, and uh, she needs IV Phenergan or IV um, Zofran for, to control her vomiting because mm -hmm. she is constantly vomiting. Mm -hmm. Say she has a tumor on her brain mm -hmm. um, and she can't control that and it is becoming very uncomfortable mm -hmm. for her and nothing oral has helped. Mm -hmm. um, we could you could admit Betty into the general inpatient unit and have IV medication given to, to her stabilize. that's more effective than oral medication, right. um, which oral medication is a challenge to give to somebody who is frequently throwing up, right. Um, right. obviously. So that's one case. Um, pain is another big one. So sometimes our patients come to us with a very high threshold of pain um, and no matter what we give them orally or transdermally or however, doesn't seem to be effective in controlling their high levels of pain. They might have a high tolerance for it. Um, and as they decline, they can't take something orally. That becomes a huge challenge. And so we have to um, put them on a unit where we can give them intravenous medication um, because we can't deliver it at home yeah. at that rate safely um, and, and monitoring of that is dangerous and so for that reason we have to put them on an inpatient unit too. Gotcha. Um, what that looks like regulatory standby same same way Medicare reimburses the hospice at a higher rate to pay that unit mm -hmm. to do that daily care again it has to have an RN on on staff 24 7 so if it's a skilled nursing facility who can handle IVs um, there has to be an RN there that mm -hmm. can do IV push medications or basically a hospital yep. um, or it could be a hospital unit um, and then the medical director our medical director continues to care for that patient um, the the unit staff will take orders only from the hospice medical gotcha. director. Um, so they're the ones that are titrating those medications. Gotcha. So it's basically you're having a hospital, renting a hospital it is to really take care of that hospital. patient yes. temporarily to stabilize them mm -hmm. and to make sure that they are safe. And a lot of times patients will go to general inpatient for a few days, mm -hmm. stabilize and come back home. Yep. You know, or you know, they may actually go to general inpatient straight from the hospital yeah. and that that may be their last, you know, time uh, yeah, you know, so would be at the hospital. Sometimes, you make a good point, a mm -hmm. lot of times patients will go to an inpatient unit to get control of something right. and then they will come back home. Mm -hmm. um, and that is the goal, is for them to pass away wherever yeah. they're used to being and not um, in an inpatient unit. Yeah. However, there are some hospices who have an inpatient unit. Mm -hmm. And so... Yeah, and that's another thing is that a lot of families, they're in the hospital and then the hospice comes and meets them in the hospital mm -hmm. and then they actually start hospice there. So when they're actually starting hospice there, what's actually happening is that they're actually starting general inpatient. That's right. Mm -hmm. And so they're not actually, you know, the hospital is actually now saying, okay, hey, let's let's stop covering this hospice is now taking over and then now GIP is started and it's kind of on the back end billing mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. you don't really you won't even feel notice it. it's yeah. happening yeah and what happens but in that situation now hospice has started mm -hmm. but it's actually started in the hospital mm -hmm. and then sometimes you know if if the disease is taking its cold toll then your loved one may not make it right mm -hmm. and they may pass in the hospital yes. on hospice mm -hmm. and that's considered general inpatient mm -hmm. so that, that's I think a lot of times we see families like that yeah and it's hard to understand that kind of dynamic between the hospital and my loved ones on hospice in the hospital. You yeah. know, I think that's a that level of care is so important. important so there me. are uh, people people call us a lot and ask us if we have a hospice house or an inpatient unit. Mm -hmm. um, 
that's a common thing. There are, it's just a matter of doing your research wherever you Different live. Different regions is, in the, in the um, nation. Uh, most cities have some sort of an inpatient unit. Mm -hmm. So we we have one here in DFW that is a, is a whole building mm -hmm. of just hospice rooms. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a beautiful facility and um, most of the patients that go there have to meet a requirement that they are expected to live less than yeah. a week. Yeah. Um, and it's given their diagnosis or they're transferring from the right. hospital right. and the family is like, no way we're not letting them die right. at home. That's too traumatic. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that's just doing your research of finding the right hospice mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. No, that's good. That's good. So that so we've kind of broke down really all the levels. You've got routine, respite, continuous care, and GIP. Mm -hmm. So I know everyone is still talking about uh, former President Jimmy Carter uh -huh. and the fact that he's been around on hospice Amazing. for so long. I'm so happy for him. I, I I I want us to talk about that a little just really briefly, yeah. and then kind of understand the life cycle of a patient and how you can be on hospice for a while. Mm -hmm and how your days can be your routine. Yeah. I think a lot of families and just people in general were just like shocked mm -hmm. that he went on to hospice. But let's kind of walk through that shock, mm -hmm. you know, phase and why people think hospice means death right away. And in Jimmy Carter's, you know, in his former president, Jimmy Carter's, um, uh, in his life, how being hospice and being on hospice is actually helpful for his family. Mm -hmm. What are your yeah, thoughts on that? I love it. I'm so happy for him. Um, I think he he made the decision to not continue treating, um, which is powerful, and it's not an easy decision to make. Mm -hmm. um, I think he realized that he wanted quality of life over treatment, and mm -hmm. so there's valid val that's a valuable thing to say. Mm -hmm. um, he came on hospice and I mean, I can't speak for his plan of care specifically, right. obviously, yeah. HIPAA. Um, yeah. <laughs> but he um, he has been on routine home care for most of his stint. Um, and it's probably been, how long has it been maybe, now? I want to say maybe April, since April he was okay. on. He came. So April, May, June, July, August. So he's probably been on it for more than six months at yeah. this point. So. Yeah. Like we talked about in our last video, mm -hmm. he's probably had his recertification done mm -hmm. twice. So mm -hmm. a nurse practitioner has come out and said, yes, still Jimmy, you still are still, still appropriate still for hospice. Yeah. You're making these tiny little declines. We're going to continue providing this excellent care for you and your family. Mm -hmm. And that's awesome. Um, so, yeah, he's he is reaping the benefits. And hospice is not a it's not a death sentence in the sense that you can't leave your home. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people say, oh, I'm not ready for hospice because I still like to go out to lunch with my friends yeah. and I still like to go to the movies. Please go. Oh, Please you go want. And <laughs> out to the movies. I love watch, movies yeah. too. That's an awesome thing. You be on hospice and go watch a movie. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's it's just, it's the treatment and the medical side of it. So it's, it's having quick access to yeah. care. Yes, it might not be that same PCP that you've seen forever, right, right. but it's quick access to care of like, oh, okay, we're seeing this decline, I've got this cough, I know I'm more fragile for the next couple of days, but my goal is next week I want to go out to lunch with my my grandson. Right. You know, like, right. that's great, right, do that. Right, right, right. I think another thing that, you know, regarding that too, there's goals that are established for hospice mm -hmm. patients. There's some hospice patients that are just trying to make it to their grandson's graduation, mm -hmm. right? And they're doing some therapy to get them a little bit stronger just while the yeah. disease process, it happens. And I think, I think hospice, I think Jimmy Carter, former president Jimmy Carter did a great job of, it's his life, right? And he, yes. they chose to do that, but it is setting an example because a lot of families don't realize the benefit of hospice. Yeah. You don't have to do this journey alone and you're paying into it via Medicare your whole life. Yeah. So those are dollars that, that actually belong to you. Yeah. I was just explaining to somebody this week that it is the best part of Medicare. Yeah, oh like, yeah. Medicare yeah, yeah. wants you to use this benefit yeah, and yeah. they don't want you to use it for five days. They no. want you to use it for yeah. three plus months yeah, yeah. Um, because it's the way our medical system is set up to yeah. support you in this yeah. stage. Um, yes, not every disease process, so you can plan for that. Um, and everyone's different, but yeah. I think it's a huge benefit. Yeah. Yeah. So. And I think the beauty behind it is, is that that Medicare issues for each life cycle of a patient, roughly about $38,000. Mm -hmm. 
you know, it's per cap, which is a hospice term, but that's a lot of money that can be used for your loved one. Yeah. Treatment, medications, DME, yeah. staffing. It can be higher utilized on hospice than it yes. can in and out of the hospital. And oh yeah, you'll ours. exhaust that. You'll exhaust that 30,000 in like a week, less than a week. Less than a week. In a hospital. Yeah. Uh, but that's a beautiful thing about hospice and I think that's why um, families need to educate themselves, mm -hmm. do their research, watch videos like this. Mm -hmm. Like, subscribe, hashtag, <laughs> you know, um, but I think those are things that are so important for, for families and any last closing words in regards to levels of care and Jimmy Carter? Ask questions. Uh, I always tell people, I sent an email to a family member today that, um, you know, these are the six questions you should ask of any hospice you're interviewing. Mm. Um, one of them being, you know, do you provide continuous care, um, and um, or will you provide continuous yeah, care? Yeah, <laughs> so that's a good that's a good point. Do you and will you? Yes. So you're required. You know, these are the levels of care that under Medicare that you're you're required to, but some agencies aren't able to. Yes. Right. So and it but, has to do with that specific agency's business side of right, it. Right. Right. Awesome. Awesome. Well. Hope well, you guys like this. Jimmy Carter. <laughs> yes. Wait, what? <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Long I, live. I pray that he is as happy as he can be. Yeah. I guess. <laughs> <laughs>